Hello everyone and welcome back to Beyond the Apex. In today's episode we're going to be talking about the Canadian Grand Prix. Now before I get into things I will put a disclaimer out there and if you haven't watched last week's episode me and Sam are no longer at uni together anymore uh, because we finished first year and we won't be back in uni till the end of September. So the next couple of months and the next couple of races this is going to be the setup for the podcast There'll be, there'll be ones here that, here and there because we are going to the London E-Prix together so you will see us back together then but for now this is a setup that you're going to have to bear with us with because we're doing the best we possibly can in the circumstances. So without further ado let's get on to the Canadian Grand Prix. Hello and welcome to my section of the podcast this week. Um, obviously, I'm sure Abby's explained, but obviously we're not a university anymore, so we can't film physically for now. Um, the next couple of uh, podcasts for F1 anyway are going to be done like we did for Australia. So uh, Abby's going to kind of uh, talk about one section of the race, whether it be the penalties, the FIA, briefly go over it, and I'll go more into depth about the race and the overtaking and stuff like that. So yeah, let's get into the race. So talking in terms of the judicial decisions of the weekend, I had a little scan through the FIA's website, and as I always do, and the first judicial of the weekend, the judicial, judicial decision, was um, an interesting one about FP1 and FP2, right? So there's supposed to be, in the regulations it says, uh, there has to be a two hour gap between FP1 and FP2, right? Um, because FP1 overran, um, that was because of CCTV camera issues, so they, they hadn't like synced them properly, um, so it was unsafe to, you know, it, it took a while to sort that issue out. Because of that, it meant that obviously the two, gap, two hour gap couldn't be sustained. So um, the second practice session uh, was extended by 30 minutes. So that meant that you still got like the full practice session, but um, obviously it was extended. But um, that was the first judicial decision of the weekend. So firstly, let's talk about the race as a whole. Uh, so obviously it was a Verstappen uh, dominance again, like we've seen so many times this season already. Uh, but overall it was quite good. Uh, cars were able to overtake, uh, especially the cars that were on alternate strategies, uh, were able to take, overtake down that main straight um, and some into the hairpin as well, as we saw with Lando uh, on... I believe it was either Stroll or Ocon at the end, uh, but it was a very, very nice overtake into the final hairpin. Uh, but yeah, let's firstly go on to Red Bull. Obviously, it was dominance. We saw it both in qualifying massively with that 1.2 second uh, kind of gap to P2, which was Hulkenberg at the time, but obviously Hulkenberg got the penalty. Um, and in the race, it was just dominance. Uh, uh, Max actually had a bird stuck in one of his brake ducts, so he was having to manage that and was still able to just manage the pace um, to what he kind of dictated. Uh, there was no point where he was kind of in any worry. I mean, at the end, uh, Alonso did kind of say that they had the race pace to um, kind of keep with the Red Bulls, but I think Red Bull was just managing that race pace for Max, um, and he was not flat out whatsoever. Um, he's led every lap for the last three races in a row. I don't think that's going to uh, stop anytime soon. But um, yeah, moving on to Checo, it was a very poor weekend. Um, I am going to use the adjective very. Um, that car is so dominant and he wasn't even able to kind of keep with the Ferraris at the end. So, and it also was a very, very poor qualifying as well. Yes, it was changeable conditions and they just simply got the strategy wrong, but he should have been in the fight for a podium and getting P6 in the end there really, really isn't the kind of the quality that Red Bull needs. But at the same time, he isn't challenging Max. I think that's kind of what Red Bull want at the moment. They just want Max to be able to storm to these championships very easily um, and not spreading out the points between teammates. Um, so yeah, that, that Red Bull works in every single situation possible and yeah, it just showed it again at Canada at a different circuit. It is still just an unbelievable uh, race car and it's just dominant. Uh, and I'm not going to lie, I really hope that Alonso gets a win this season. But at the moment, I just can't see it. I really, really can't. So what a weekend we had. It was one of those interesting weekends. It wasn't a boring one, so say. Um, we had weather it was a big factor that played in the weekend. Um, and the outcome was Verstappen, Alonso and Hamilton. So good to see Alonso P2. Can we just take a minute? 
I mean, a lot like um, not Alonso, Aston Martin are flying this season. I mean, we've said that through every episode so far, but they are there's a fly. <laughs> they are really a fly. They are really showing great progress, and I think they are. Well, obviously, they're not in in contention with Red Bull, but they they're putting up a fight. You know, so say. Um, so, but also it was really good to see Alonso and Hamilton again on the podium together. I mean, what can we say? That's that's just, you know, for all, all, the, all the F1 fans that know, it's just so good to see them back together on the podium. And obviously seeing Hamilton up there as well is a really good thing. I mean, he's not had the best of luck um, with the car and, and, and the team recently, in recent seasons. So it's really good to see them again. That's that. That took longer than expected, but yes, what a great result from the weekend. Verstappen, I mean, there's not really much you can say there, it's just dominance, isn't it? Um, he's just showing so much pace everywhere, at every track, and it's just it's just showing with, with the results. But yeah, moving on to Ferrari, which was actually really quite a positive Sunday. Um, they had a terrible qualifying, obviously Sainz got that penalty, he did get into Q3, uh, but he did get that penalty for impeding Gasly, which was warranted, um, to be fair. It was quite a dangerous impediment, um, impediment, impediment. Um, but yeah, it was quite dangerous, so it was a warranted penalty. Uh, but yeah, Charles really was off the pace in qualifying. But finally, they had a good strategy in the race. And uh, Helmut Marko after the race actually said that the race pace of the Ferraris would have been able to keep with the Red Bull, the Red Bull pace when they were managing it, not, I think, the ultimate race pace of the Red Bull. Um, but yeah, they finally had a good strategy. At one point when they kind of didn't pit under the safety car, I was quite worried again. I was like, they've just missed another opportunity. But it got them track position in front of the DRS train. They had the pace, they showed it, and they got P4 and P5, which I think was a very, very good result for Ferrari, which is crazy to think about, but it was a good result for Ferrari after the last couple races um, that they've had. So yeah. Positive Sunday for Ferrari, uh, which is normally the other way around. So, yeah, very, very happy to see. Uh, moving on to Mercedes, um, the upgrades do kind of seem like they're working. I mean, obviously, we can't tell them completely yet. Um, and obviously, they're not in that kind of that jump to the Red Bull. But definitely in terms of keeping with the Aston Martin, I do think those upgrades are working. And they're working for both Hamilton and George as well. Um, we saw in qualifying that George was, I think he was like 200 off of Lewis at some points and things like that. So two very good teammates with a car that is definitely, definitely underneath them. Um, and at one point it did kind of look like Lewis was in that fight for P2 with Alonso. Um, obviously Alonso increased his pace. Um, but yeah, it was a very, very solid weekend for Mercedes, apart from George, um, which was unfortunate. His crash, it was his fault completely, there's kind of no denying that. It was a mistake um, and it punished him severely. But his recovery would have meant points. Um, but it was unfortunate for the brakes. I think it was the brakes that were um, that went out on him. Uh, but it would have meant good points. Um, he kind of would have been around the album, so kind of P7, P8 mark. Um, which would have been good for a recovery because he was clearly at the back at one point. Um, but yeah, the crash was his fault, it was completely him, and yeah, it was unfortunate to see. But it was still a good, um, it was still a good weekend, um, and I think they are still ahead of Aston Martin, just by a few points now. Um, but yeah, that fight for P2 and the Constructors is definitely looking feisty. Um, especially with that Ferrari race pace kind of showing promise as well in a way. Um, so yeah, hopefully it's a three car battle for P2. I mean, if Red Bull wasn't here, it would be one hell of a championship. But uh, unfortunately, Red Bull is here and Max is completely dominating. Um, so let's move on to Alpine. Again, as I said, unlucky for uh, Gasly in qualifying with the impeding. He would have got into Q2, probably would have got into Q3 and would have been around Ocon. So maybe the qualifying around the P6, P7 mark. Um, but Ocon qualified where the car should be at the moment, especially in qualifying pace, uh, and it was a good race result. But uh, at the end, on the final lap, it was a little bit dubious defending from Ocon. I won't lie. Um, so yeah, it's unfortunate to see as a McLaren fan because it kind of looks at points this season that we're in that battle for P5. But yeah, the Alpine is clearly ahead. They are just going to be in a league of their own in terms of the midfield um, this season, which is unfortunate to see. But Moving on to McLaren, 
there are rumours that this B-Spec car that they're bringing to Silverstone is going to be, kind of bring them up massively apparently, according to people like Mika Hakkinen and people in the team as well, they're kind of saying that he's, these upgrades are really going to push them up and kind of past Alpine and towards that top four. So I'm trying, as a McLaren fan, I'm trying not to get excited about those. Um, but yeah, it is looking like it's uh, kind of, there's a light at the end of the tunnel for McLaren fans in a way. Uh, but yeah, moving on to the race weekend, um, so if it wasn't for the red flag, uh, Lando would have qualified massively higher than he did, obviously he qualified P7, um, but if he'd got that lap in literally 20 seconds before the red flag, um, he would have been around P2, P3 area, which would have been fantastic for him, uh, he probably would have got fronting damage knowing Lando's luck anyway, uh, but um, yeah, it was still a decent qualifying, obviously both cars, strong qualifying pace, both cars got into Q3, um, Oscar showing great promise as well, uh, easily the best rookie this season so far, There's, I don't think there's any doubt about that at the moment. Uh, the race was unlucky, um, the second stop wasn't needed in the end, but hindsight is a great thing as we know, um, and if it wasn't for that second stop we would have been around the P7 mark, um, which would have been points, which was annoying. Um, obviously we came home with no points at, uh, at the end of Canada, um, which is kind of our lucky race, um, which kind of came out in qualifying, uh, in commentary over the race weekend, uh, because we haven't scored points there since 2014, which is a crazy stat bearing in mind we won the race in 2011 with Jensen. So uh, yeah, and the Lando penalty, I'll throw it down here, it was unlucky, uh, but it was deserved. Um, he did back up. Even though he was trying to reason at the end that it was kind of it was it was it was unsportsmanlike behaviour and every every driver did that, um, but yeah it was a deserved penalty. He did back up, um, and yeah I do think it was deserved. Obviously Abby will go into way more depth with this I'm sure, um, but yeah personally even though I am a diehard Lando fan it was deserved, but it was just unlucky, very unlucky. Um, so yeah let's move on to the second half of the grid. Right, so moving on to the second half of the grid. Um, so firstly, starting with Alfa Romeo. Um, <laughs> again, two weeks in a row, it was an alright race weekend for Alfa Romeo. Um, obviously, I think they got into Q3 with Bottas. Um, Joe just missed out. Um, but he scored points. I think it was a P9 in the end um, for Valtteri, um, which is kind of needed for him because he was definitely down on Joe throughout the first kind of bit of the season. Um, so he had a good race, brought home points for the team. Um, I think him and Joe are now on equal points. And yeah, it was a it was a positive weekend for them. I definitely think they can kind of go out the weekend with their head held high. Um, strategy did help massively with them. Um, but at the same time, they were there and they scored the points. Um, which is <laughs> good to say about Alfa Romeo because we were kind of starting to worry about them because they were nowhere in race pace, nowhere in quality pace. Um, but yeah, it's starting to look up for them, and I'm not gonna lie. There's not much to say about Joe. He kind of just had kind of a very understated weekend. Obviously, he didn't score any points, um, and I think he got into Q2, but uh, or he might have been on the brink of uh, getting into Q2. Um, but yeah, it wasn't a positive qualifying, and kind of just climbed the ranks with people uh, not finishing. Um, so yeah, but it wasn't <laughs> another bad weekend for Alfa Romeo, which is what they need at the moment. But moving on to Aston Martin, which is always kind of our favourite part of the uh, podcast every week or every race weekend. But fantastic pace for Alonso, bearing in mind he was uh, he was managing an issue throughout the entirety of the race. Still kept ahead of Lewis. Um, he said he could kind of he thought he was going to be able to push up to Max, and at the end I did kind of think uh, think he said like he was trying he wanted to win the race or something. Um, but he came a very convincing uh, P two. And yeah, that Aston Martin just has fantastic pace, both in qualifying and the race once again. And apparently the team are going to bring uh, upgrades to Silverstone, like McLaren, um, which apparently should push them even closer to Red Bull, um, which will make this, this championship very interesting, not in terms of points, uh, but for the second half of the season, hopefully it'll be more competitive. Uh, but moving on to Lance, <laughs> for a home race, it was just so disappointing. Um, his quality pace was nowhere, um, but he did get points in the end uh, with a very good strategy. He kind of, at one point, he pitted, went all the way down to P18 or P19, and just undercut everyone um, on that two-stop strategy. 
Um, so yeah, fantastic strategy, uh, but with that car, Lance should be a lot, lot higher. He should be near where Perez was and kind of where Ocon, well, not Ocon, sorry, uh, where the Ferraris were with that car, but he's just nowhere. And getting outpaced and outqualified by Alonso every single race, which is not a good look for him at all. Um, but yeah, another good, uh, good weekend for Aston Martin. As I said, closing the gap to P2, um, although I do think Lance is going to hinder them in that battle. Um, but yeah, Alonso closing up to Checo in the drivers as well, which will be a very exciting kind of battle to look through uh, for the rest of the championship because he believed himself that he can get P2 in the drivers. So that will be very interesting indeed. One of the most interesting you know, judicial decisions of the weekend that I like to see is the pit lane speeding. There seems to be a lot in terms of every weekend that I've that I've looked at, you know, in the, in the whole F1 calendar. But this weekend in Canada, we had Stroll and Sonoda speeding in the pit lane. Now, this is, I found this really interesting. This may be really boring for everyone else, but Stroll was fined, well, not Stroll, Aston Martin, the team, were fined a thousand euros because he exceeded the limit of 80 kilometers an hour by 17.8 kilometers, right? So that's a quite a big, that's quite a big difference, like, yeah. But Sonoda, on the other hand, he only exceeded the 80 kilometers per hour limit by 0.4 kilometers per hour. So that meant that the team, AlphaTauri, were only fined a hundred euros. But still an unnecessary thing when you come to think about all the technology they have, they still speed in the pit lane. But, you know, I thought that was quite interesting. The difference between a thousand euros and a hundred euros. Like a hundred euros for a team isn't, like well, it's not even that big of a deal, I don't know. But yeah, anyway, interesting, interesting thought. Uh, moving on to Haas, um, an incredible qualifying from Nico Hülkenberg. Uh, he just pulls out these results like uh, Silverstone 2020, I believe, in the uh, in the not the Force India, I was about to say Force India then, uh, in the racing point. Obviously, Brazil 2010, I think it was 2010, uh, where he stuck it on pole. Um, he always has these kind of qualifying results, which are just out of the blue. Um, but the highest uh, qualifying result ever, uh, ever st starting position anyway for the race for Haas. Um, but unfortunately, he did get a penalty, put him down to P5. I personally think it's a little bit too severe. Um, hopefully, Ab Abby again will um, go into this. But I do think it was a bit too severe. Bearing in mind, he was finishing a lap. The red flag then came out and then he did somewhat reduce his pace. But in the red flag, you have to reduce it down fully because it is dangerous conditions. And yeah, it, it, the penalty was given. Was it deserved? No. Was it viable? Yes. So it was just unfortunate and they didn't have any race pace like usual. Um, that P5 turned into a P15 or P16, I think, um, which is so unfortunate to see. It would have been amazing to see uh, Hülkenberg in the points again. Uh, but yeah, unfortunately... He wasn't, and Magnussen did uh, very well to recover after that first lap incident. Uh, he kind of, I thought he was going to be uh, out retired after that. Um, it looked like a very big hit to the wall, uh, but he did manage to continue. Um, somewhat saved, um, saved that incident, and yeah, recovered back up to P fourteen, I think P thirteen. Um, but yeah, it does look like Magnussen is just getting out qualified and somewhat outpaced by his teammates still. Hülkenberg is definitely looking like the first driver in that team at the moment. Moving on to AlphaTauri, who had just a horrific weekend, I won't lie. Uh, no pace at all, both in qualifying and race, which is weird for them uh, at the moment because they do look like they have somewhat pace in qualifying sometimes, um, with Yuki anyway. Um, and then he can kind of carry that team to a P11, P10. Um, but no, they didn't have any qualifying pace. Um, it was wet, so maybe that was the reason for that. Um, De Vries had just a crash which wasn't necessary. Um, I will argue that the first kind of move into turn one was a kind of replica of, I think it was Hamilton and Leclerc in Silverstone 2022. And no one was complaining about that incident at the time where he kind of pushed him into the inside of the corner. Um, so I had no problems with that kind of turn one incident where he kind of pushed Magnussen off the track and kind of sent it. 
Um, but obviously that turn three incident where he just out outbraked himself caused both him and Magnussen or is it Hulkenberg? I'm not sure. I think it was Magnussen. Uh, both to go down the runoff area. It was a shame. Doesn't help his image at all. And there's now rumours circulating that like there always is in the paddock that he's going to get replaced so on and so forth. But those are always paddock rumours. So there's no kind of real weight behind those. Um, but yeah, it was, it was unfortunate. Um, and yeah, I think that was just hard racing at the start. But obviously that second instant was 100% Nick's fault. Um, and yeah, they're now bottom of the standings, which is not good, bearing in mind, obviously, they were winning races three years ago. They were getting on the podium somewhat on pace, obviously back in 2021 with Gasly. Um, that was only two years ago, and now they are dead bottom of the standings. Yuki is carrying that team, uh, no doubt. If it was, obviously it wouldn't be, but if it was two rookies in that team, they would be dead last, zero points. Um, it is unfortunate to see and they really need to step up their game um, but hopefully in the coming races Yuki will continue to show that he is one of the drivers of the season so far uh, pulling that car to places where it shouldn't be um, but yeah overall that was a, it was a horrible weekend for Alfa Tauri um, but moving on from a stark difference uh, to usual and a very quite opposite to AlphaTauri, Williams. What a result. P7 with Alex. Um, obviously, that car is basically built for straight lines only and is just a dog in the corners. Um, but that was all that was needed for Canada. He was able to defend into the last turn, into the last chicane, um, with the straight line speed of that Williams. And they did have upgrades as well, which could kind of link to their good performance. But I do think it was strategy. Obviously, he stayed out when others pitted and was able to just keep them behind with what his radio engineer called the Albon, the classic Albon defending. Um, but yeah, he, Albon did a fantastic job, rocketed Williams up to where uh, kind of Haas is now. Um, and are they going to be in the fight for the kind of P8 in the constructors? It'd be very interesting to see. Um, but yeah, what a result! What a result for the Williams team. So glad to uh, so glad to see him like that. Um, according to Alex, kind of after the race when he was in the interviews, apparently they've had a really difficult past couple of weeks, kind of scrapping together money, trying to get upgrades, people working late, and clearly a very deserved result because of that. Sergeant, shame about his issue, um, but let's be real, he would have been out of the points anyway. Um, he is being demolished by Alex at the moment. And I do kind of think he is somewhat below De Vries at the moment. He is getting considerably smashed by his teammate, especially in qualifying pace every single race this season. And he really needs to step up his game. Otherwise, again, rumours in the paddock, but these ones have been kind of more prevalent um, in the last uh, day or two. That there are rumours that Mick might um, replace uh, Sergeant mid-season at the Austrian Grand Prix. Um, Mick said there's kind of an announcement coming soon to do with his driver moves and things like that. So, very interesting rumours. And obviously, Sergeant has not been performing well at all. Apart from Bahrain, his first race of the season, he's just been performing terribly. And it's been kind of overlooked um, because obviously, De Vries in the spotlight for being the terrible rookie. But yeah, Sergeant is not doing well. And I think a move, you have to always give rookies a chance, but when teams like Williams are possibly looking at signing Schumacher, half a season to make a decision, look, Red Bull did it in 2019 with Gasly and Alex, and look, if they put Schumacher in for the rest of the season, uh, midway through the season obviously, and kind of saw where both of the drivers are because Williams need points they need money they need to be getting points in the constructors and if Sargent isn't giving that to them then is it worth just giving Mick Schumacher a try obviously he's more kind of he crashes a lot more but at the same time he has been in the points in his F1 career he has two years of experience is it worth it? Possibly. So I guess we will see what happens with that. Um, obviously, it's the Austrian Grand Prix in two weeks. Um, my location will be a little bit different for that one. Um, and Abby will be carrying the podcast for the next two weeks. Um, but all will be explained uh, after the Austrian Grand Prix. Uh, but yeah, that is the end of my section of the podcast. And I'll give it over to Abby to do the outro. So yeah, goodbye. 
And so with that, we're going to bring this episode to a close. I hope you enjoyed. I mean, I will apologise now that I didn't make that much of an appearance in this episode, but once again, like I... I, no, I didn't say it at the beginning, but I had I hadn't actually got around to watching the race. I've been very busy, so I couldn't really give much input into what happened. So I'll let Sam do most of the talking. Um, but I will be back next next. Is it next? Well, I'll be back for the next race weekend, and things will be pretty much back to normal. So I hope you enjoyed. Uh, don't forget to subscribe, and I will see you next episode.